Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to the session of Managerial Economics. I am Dr. Supriya Jain, working as an assistant professor in the Institute of Business Management at GLA University, Mathura. Let's start with our today's uh, session. And before we proceed further, let us have a look to the topics which we have covered in our previous session. In the previous session, we have talked about monopoly market as well as monopolistic competitive market. We have understood the different feature of these markets and we have seen how we can determine the price and output under the short run as well as in the long run. So here in this monopoly market, we have seen that he is a single seller and the product which a monopolist sells in the market does not have a cross substitute, right? And uh, just like that, right? So the entry under this market have a restriction and the monopolists also have an advantage of price discrimination. He is the price maker. He can make independent decisions regarding the prices and the output of the firm. And he can also discriminate among the prices where he can charge different prices of same commodity from different consumer, right? Thereafter, we have talked about demand and revenue curve of this monopoly market. And like I said, demand in the monopoly market is highly inelastic because the person, uh, the seller is the single seller and does not have a close substitute. So usually we say that the demand under this monopoly market is highly inelastic. And because of that, this is how we represent the demand curve of the monopoly market, which will be downward sloping, right? This AR is the demand curve and it is, uh, you know, it is steeper because the demand is highly inelastic, right? Which states that a lesser change uh, or, you know, higher change in the prices causes a lesser change in the demand. And below to this lies the marginal revenue of the curve. Whereas if we see the demand curve of monopolistic competitive market, monopolistic competitive market has a highly elastic demand because in this market, there are a lot, a lot many firms working in the market and the products which they are selling are of close uh, substitute of each other. So if you look at the demand curve of the monopolistic competitive market, this is how we represent the demand curve for the monopolistic competitive market which is again downward sloping curve, but this curve is a little flatter, right? In the, in the case of monopoly market, demand curve is a steeper in nature, whereas in monopolistic competitive market, the demand curve is a little flatter, represent that the demand here is, uh, you know, highly elastic in nature. And below to this, again, lies your marginal revenue curve. And this is how we determine the price and output in the short run as well as in the long run. Thereafter, we have seen the price and output determination in short run as well as in the long run under monopoly. And basically, there is a little difference between the short run and the long run consideration because uh, in this monopoly market, being a single seller, a monopolist firm usually earn super normal profit because uh, there is no uh, close substitute of the commodity, but it is not uh, always that a monopolist will always earn super normal or abnormal profit, right? There can be a possibility where monopolists can also earn normal profit or might can incur a loss. And the only difference here in the monopoly market in the short run and the long run is that, that in short run we have certain factors which are of fixed nature, whereas in long run there are no fixed inputs. We have all the inputs which we can vary to change the size of the operation. And one thing which we have understood here under the monopoly market, that monopolies need not have to work up to the equilibrium point because he can make this independent decision. He can produce up to the point where a monopolist is able to increase his profit margins, right? So it is not very important for the monopolist to work or to reach up to the equilibrium point only, right? Thereafter, we have talked about price discrimination. As we have understood, this is a, a you know, art of selling a same commodity to different people at different prices and who can do, discriminate among the prices of the commodity. For that, we have also talked about some specific conditions like 
uh, a person who has the control over the supply on the, of the market can only discriminate among the prices. A person who is capable of dividing the market into two or more sub-markets, right? Because in a single market, you cannot charge different prices. And for, for that, uh, these different markets should have different price elasticities also. That is, again, very important. And lastly, we have seen that no one from the low price market is capable of, uh, you know, buying from the low price market and sell it to the other uh, price market. If people have started doing that, in that case, that monopolist will reduce, uh, you know, left the control over the supply and uh, might not be able to discriminate among the prices, right? So how a monopolist is going to determine how much quantity should be sold in one market and what should be the price and how much quantity should be uh, sold in the another market and what should be the price in the another market. So for that, we have also understood this price and output discrimination right, determination under this price discrimination in our previous lecture. And lastly, we have talked about monopolistic competitive market. This is the market where we have large number of buyers and seller and the product which they are selling are of heterogeneous nature, right. And this is very important because this is one thing on the basis of which the competi you know, competition is there, right. Under the monopolistic competitive market, the competition is not on the basis of prices, but on the basis of product, right? The, uh, how well you are able to differentiate your product from the others, right? So that determines the price of your commodity. Here in this monopolistic competitive market, selling cost also plays a very important role because under this market, firms spend a lot of money on the advertisement and that will add it to the selling cost. Another important feature of this market that, uh, you know, new firms entry is not restricted, right? There is an unrestricted entry as well as active. Any new firm can enter into the industry and any existing firm can exit the industry any time, right? Under this market, we have also seen that the consumer does not have a perfect knowledge and that is why for that reason they are also ready to buy at the higher prices, right? But uh, this is for sure because we, in this monopolistic competitive market, each firm have their own set of loyal customer, right? They have their set of loyal customer and at the same time they are competing in the market because of the availability of substitute. That is why we call it as a monopolistic competitive market, right? So here we have seen how we determine the prices under this monopolistic competitive firm in the short run as well as in the long run. Uh, and here the conditions will be same which we have discussed under the perfect competition, right? Under this monopolistic competitive market in the short run, uh, the, we have fixed inputs as well as variable inputs. And the another important thing is, uh, does, uh, does this market structure allow the firms to enter? But because the short run is not an enough time frame for any new firm to enter, therefore, uh, the firms working under the perfect comp uh, this monopolistic competition in the short run, some of them are earning super normal profit, some of them earns normal profit, or some of them might incur a loss, right? Whereas in the long run, firms operating under monopolistic competitive market only earns normal profit, right? And this is the uh, why they are only earning normal profit because the firms who earn super normal profit in the short run will attract new suppliers to the industry or will increase their existing capacity, which will increase the supply in the market. And when supply will increase, the price of the commodity will go down and the cost of production will also increase. When there will be more production, factors of production cost will increase and the cost of production will be increased. So they will reach up to the point where they will be earning normal profit. And the firms which were incurring the loss, some of them will leave the industry or some of them might reduce their capacity, right? Which will increase, which will decrease the supply and this decrease in supply will help them to increase the price in the market as well as when the supply will be decreased, price of the commodity will also go down and again they will reach up to the point where they would be earning only normal profit. So this is how we understand the price and output determination in the short run as well as in the long run. Now we are going to talk about uh, the oligopoly market, right, which is again a very important for us to understand how this oligopoly market structures work. So let us look at the learning objective of this session. Here you will be able to examine the nature of an oligopoly market, right? What is the basic nature of this oligopoly market that you will be able to examine? 
then you will be able to understand the immediate demand curve, right? Uh, intermediate demand curve, as because in this oligopoly market, uh, demand curve cannot be determined in advance, right? So here the demand curve is indetermined uh, for uh, the firms under oligopoly, and it also looks into various models of price and output decisions under oligopoly. So for the uh, price and output determination, how much price and output should be produced by the firm in the short run as well as in the long run, we have certain models, right? And those models we are going to study in this lecture. Then you will be able to comprehend the nuances of collusive oligopoly, right? What happens to the firms when they make collusion, right? When they make cartel and with uh, the detailed analysis of various forms which also include cartel. And then lastly, you'll be able to identify with the practice of uh, price leadership by an oligopolis, right? So what uh, happens to the oligopolis firm if the price leadership is being taken up by a, uh, you know, a single firm working in this oligopoly market. So let's begin with what is an oligopoly market and how does this market work? So the very first point says that, as we know, this is the market where we have few dominant seller, right? This is the market where we have few suppliers, right? They are not very large in number, but yes, they are the dominant sellers, sell differentiated or homogeneous product. So one thing which we need to understand here is oligopoly firm or oligopoly form of market have set of sellers which can produce the products which are of similar nature. They can be homogeneous goods or they can be heterogeneous goods, right? So if the firm uh, working under this oligopoly market are having different uh, in their product, then we call it as a differentiated oligopoly where the product uh, amongst the seller are different from each other. Whereas if we talk about pure oligopoly, then the products which are being sold by these firms are of uh, similar nature, right? They are homogeneous, they are same or identical to each other, right? So next, let us look at the features of this oligopoly market. So what we are saying here, we have few sellers, right? The number of sellers are very, are not very large in number. And here the product is very, again, very important what kind of product they are producing. Either the product is of homogeneous nature or there is a differentiation in the product. Then, uh, you know, there is an entry barrier. Though there is not restrictive entry, but definitely if you want to be a part of this oligopoly market, then there are few things which will, uh, you know, act as a barrier for you, like huge investment requirement, right? So these, uh, this is the market structure where if you want to enter into it, you need a lot of investments, huge capital uh, requirement is being needed, which is not possible for everyone to make that kind of a investment. So that is why it does not allow many people to enter into this area. Secondly, strong customer loyalty for existing brand yes for this if you talk about this oligopoly market there are people who have a strong loyalty for the existing brand so if you also want to enter into this area then might be you won't be able to uh, you know get get that kind of a demand in the market because already the player who are there in the market they have good set of loyal customers right so they are not might be interested in shifting their uh, demand to the new firms. And then there is economies of scale. Yes, this is something which you need to recall back. Economies of scale, this is something where if the firms are operating at the large scale, they get various advantages, right? So the per unit cost of the companies will go down and this is how they are able to produce their product at a lower cost because large firms will able to get economies in terms of labor, where they can have a division of work, where they can take an advantage of specialization of work, right? Because in the large organization, we can divide our work, right? And based on that division, we can give these specific tasks to the people which make them specialize into their work. And this specialization will help in the reduction of cost as well as supervision and time, right? Large firms also get economies in terms of technology, better and you know advanced methods of technology can be adopted which will help you in producing more and more production will help you in the cost reduction right large scale firms can also have an advantage in terms of you know marketing right marketing where you are spending money on the promotion of your commodities right so your per unit cost will get reduced if you are 
for uh, you know producing or you know advertising for the goods which you are producing large in number right your per, per, you know production cost also reduces because the raw material which you are going to procure you will be procuring it in bulk and on bulk purchase you will get good discounts right so economies of scales also stop the other firms to enter into the market because they might not be able to start up with their business with this kind of huge investments and the large capital requirement and will not be able to produce on the lower margins right so the survival becomes difficult for the new entrant so therefore we say that there is a kind of an entry barriers then we have interdependence decision making this is a very important feature of this oligopoly market that they basically have a group behavior right uh, whatever the decisions they are making they need to make interdependent decision making like we have talked about monopolies we have talked about monopolistic competitive market players they are having independent decision making right they they are not concerned with uh, the other firms right they can make their individual decisions regarding the price as well as the output whereas if you talk about oligopoly firm because they are very uh, few firms in the market so the effect of any change which you are making either in the price or in the output of your commodity will definitely affect the competitive firm right so here the decisions are usually made together and lastly we have in determined demand curve right the demand curve cannot be determined in advance like we have uh, discussed in the perfect competition demand curve is perfectly elastic in case of monopoly demand curve is highly inelastic whereas in case of monopolistic competitive market demand curve is highly elastic so like that we cannot determine the demand curve for oligopoly market it is indetermined right because again uh, why the demand curve is indetermined reason being there are very few sellers and the products which they are selling in the market also uh, are very close substitute of each other right so this is how we understand this oligopoly market firm and if we talk about the price and output decisions how these oligopoly firms uh, make out their price and output decision so here we have few models uh, given for the better understanding of this oligopoly market so we will start first with nick demand curve which is also called as price rigidity model right so in this oligopoly market the firms have a kind of a rigidity so this we are going to study then we will talk about price leadership model right then we have carnot's model stekelberg's model we have cartel model which is a collusive form of model and in cartel we can have centralized cartel or we can have market sharing cartel so let us start with our discussion of nick demand curve right now what is this nick demand curve nick demand curve is uh, been studied by professor suzy right and uh, the, this is been named by him as an price rigidity model or nick demand curve why the name is been called as nick demand curve because the shape of this curve uh, you know the graph which we are going to study is of nick uh, you, you can see here i can show you the shape the shape which we are getting here is a nicked shape and that is why we call this curve as in nick demand curve i'll explain you how we are going to understand it the nature of demand curve or the average revenue curve in oligopoly market is generally nicked right the nature of demand curve okay like we are talking about the demand curve of the previous market structure so here usually the demand curve of oligopoly firm as per professor suzy that it is of nicked shape right uh, which is also uh, you know that says that eq is the prevailing price in the market at which quantity oq can be sold so here you can see eq this eq is the price at which the product is been sold in the market and oq is the output which the firms are selling right which a firm is selling so how we are going to understand this price rigidity model and by this demand curve is of nick shape so let us see uh, the explanation right let us look at the explanation of this graph here on the x axis we have output and on the y axis we are representing the revenue cost as well as the price and this ad curve which is of nicked shape this is basically representing the demand for the firms in this oligopoly market so that is why this demand curve is represented as an average revenue curve because demand generates the revenue for the firm now what we are saying that eq is the price 
at EQ price we are selling OQ output. Now why this has been called as price rigidity model because there is a kind of a rigidity. So if a firm is selling uh, at this price EQ, uh, EQ price OQ output then things will remain okay. But if any firm, right, if any individual firm will increase the price, suppose if any individual firm increases the price from point E to A, right, then what will happen to the other firms? Definitely this firm who is going to increase the price of the commodity will not be benefited because the other firms will not increase the prices of their commodity and here because of the increase in the price of this commodity people will shift their demand to the substitutes. So here what will happen the demand of the curve, dem uh, you know demand marginal revenue of the curve will be downward sloping right there, there will be lot of elasticity you will see right because when there will be an increase in the price of any individual firm and the other firms are not increasing the price in that case the firm will lose its customer right they will shift to the substitute goods whereas if that individual firm will reduce the price of the commodity for any reason right if they want to reduce the price then what will happen the other firms will also reduce the price right and again if the other firms will reduce the price then there will be no change taking place in the demand because again the substitute product is also being available at the lesser price and you are also making it available at the lesser price. So here demand would be of inelastic nature right. If you further increase the price the other firms will also increase the price. So there will be a kind of a price war will take place right. But you will not get benefited neither by increasing the price nor by decreasing the price right. So what we are trying to understand here with this price rigidity model or the Nick demand curve model it says that here uh, it will be beneficial for the firm if they will sell on the price which has been determined by uh, the firms altogetherly rather than making any individual decision regarding the price. Uh, there is a sort of price rigidity because neither increase in the price is going to give the benefit to the firm nor the decrease in the price will give any benefit to the firm. Even if you can say that if the price war started it will benefit the customers only right customer will be at benefit. So here you can see if you will continue with the reduction in the price and the other firms also continue with the reduction in the price your marginal revenue curve can go below 0 also and it can be negative right which is not good for the firm. Right. So let us look at the uh, deeper understanding of this oligopoly uh, model which is known as Nick demand curve model or the price rigidity model. We are saying that uh, if oligopoly firm tries to reduce the price right like I said if a firm try to reduce the price to attract more customers uh, you know other competing firms will follow him by reducing the price also okay. So if they are reducing if this oligopoly firm will reduce the price other firms will also re uh, reduce the price therefore customer will remain indifference right there will be no difference in this uh, case. So in other words this part of demand curve will be steeper showing relatively less elastic demand curve. So you can say in this curve uh, this part of demand is of inelastic nature and this part of demand curve is of elastic nature because when you will in individually increase the price the competing firms are not following you and you will see a sudden shift in the demand of your commodity because people will shift to the demand of the other commodity right because their price will be lesser. So here the demand will be of elastic nature so this demand curve is basically a uh, little more flatter right and whereas this demand curve is little more steeper because if you will reduce the price the following firm will follow you and they will also reduce their price so they will uh, the customer will remain indifferent right. So this is what is called as price rigidity model or Nick demand curve model. I hope this model is clear to every one of you right. Now let us look at the another model where we have price leadership model. Now price leadership model is again a uh, another way of determining the prices and the output which the firms are going to sell under this oligopoly market and as the name is been uh, called as price leadership model so what we usually do, uh, do in this model uh, there is uh, the firms working under this oligopoly market one of them is being chosen as a leading firm right as a leader and the other firms will follow what a leading firm is doing. 
So the model known as price leadership model under the oligopoly and in this model one of the oligopoly firm may be elected as a price leader and this uh, election of a leader can be done on different criterias, right? So different criterias may be used to elect a price leader. It may be a firm who is a dominant uh, player who produces the large proportion, uh, a, a, a single firm who's producing the large proportion of the total market supply or maybe a firm who earns the largest profit or the firm producing at the minimum cost. So there can be any criteria which you can take for uh, you know, choosing the leader in the market or there can be a firm who is uh, able to do all of these, producing the highest output, uh, you know, having the minimum cost and earning the largest profit. So that particular firm would be considered to be a leading firm. So here, let us look at this graph where you will be able to understand how do we show this price leadership model. So here we have again on the x-axis we have output and here we have revenue cost and price. I hope this is clear to every one of you by now because it is always the uh, you know relationship of revenue price and cost which we study on the output. So here on the x-axis we always keep the dependent variable and independent variables are always kept on the y-axis. So this capital A and capital D represents the total demand in the market. Whereas uh, small d represents the demand for market A and market B. We are taking here and considering that in this market we have two firms. One is uh, firm A and another one is firm B, right? So this small d represents the demand for firm A and firm B. Now as you can see, this is a downward sloping curve which represent that again in the oligopoly market, lesser will be the price, more will be the output or quantity demanded. And below to the average revenue curve, we have this marginal revenue curve, right? Because average curve uh, is downward sloping, therefore the marginal curve will always be also be downward sloping and which lies below to your average revenue curve. And here we have shown these marginal cost curve, right? So marginal cost uh, is again the cost of producing one additional unit. Since we are taking two firms for our consideration, so here we have marginal cost curve of firm A and this is the marginal cost curve for the firm B, right? Which represents as MCB and this represents as MCA. And if you remember, we need to calculate this equilibrium point and the equilibrium point is the point where the marginal cost is equal to the marginal revenue and where the marginal cost curve cuts the marginal revenue curve from below. So here we have this marginal cost curve for firm A and this is the marginal cost curve for firm B. So you can see we will get this uh, equilibrium point and equilibrium point for firm A will be this point and for firm B will be this point because at this point MCB is equals to uh, you know P PB, right? This is the equilibrium point for firm B and at point PA uh, the firm A is getting the equilibrium because here the marginal cost and marginal revenue of the firms are equal. Okay, so let us look how these firms are working and how we are going to find out the leading firm. So you can see that firm A is producing OQA based on this equilibrium point, right? This is the output which firm A is producing and firm B is producing OQB, right? So this is the output which is being produced by the firm A. Firm is producing o up to OQA, right? And where is uh, the firm B is producing OQB, right? Uh, based on the equilibrium point. And if you look at the price, this will be the price for the firm A and this will be the price for the firm B, right? And if you look at the profit margin, the profit margin of firm A is this and the profit margin of the firm A is the difference between this point, right? So you can see with this graph, firm B is producing more, right? And the cost of production is lesser, the price in the market are lower and the profit margin is also higher. So if we are comparing these two firms together and to find out the leading firm in the market, we will choose B firm as a leading firm because as compared to the firm A, firm B is producing more of the output, selling product at the lower price and having the more profit margins, right? So how we are choosing a leading firm in the market that we can see with this, um, you know, price leadership model, right? 
So I hope this model is clear. Again, we have this explanation given here what we have discussed. As you can see, firm B attains the equilibrium point at PB, uh, where its marginal cost curve is MCB, right, which intersect the MR curve and they fix up the prices that is MQB and produces OQB output, right? This OQB output they are producing and they fixes the price that is MQB, right? Whereas firm A produces OQA output and they are keeping the price that is RQA, right? So what we are trying to find out here, we are finding out the leading firm who is doing the best, right? Who is producing more at the lesser pricing they are selling to the market and they are able to generate more profit, right? So this is all about our price leadership model. I hope it is clear. And now let us move to the third model, which is called as Carnot's model, right? Now what are the implications of this Carnot model? Let us look at the understanding of this model. This model is basically given by Augustin Carnot, right? The name of the person who studied this model is Augustin Carnot, and this model is based on certain assumptions. So for the understanding of this model, it is very much important for us to know the assumptions. So the very first assumption says that each firm aim at maximizing profit that we already know because all the firms have this objective of maximizing profit. So where they will be able to get this maximum profit at the equilibrium point and here the equilibrium point is the point where the marginal cost is equal to the marginal revenue. This we have already seen from our previous study also that equilibrium point will be the point where the firm will have their marginal cost equals to the marginal revenue. The additional cost of producing one product gives you the same additional revenue by selling that commodity will be the equilibrium point. The second assumption of this model says that the cost of production is nil, right? So this is the assumption which we have to make. Why it happens, how it happens is not what we are questioning here. These are the assumptions for our study and as you all know, economics has certain laws and theories. Uh, we have certain models which are based on these assumptions. So if we are not assuming these things, it will be difficult for us to have this study, right? So here the cost of production is nil and because these springs are available free from the nature, therefore the marginal cost is equals to zero. Right, so here in this case, marginal cost is equals to zero. So to attain this, uh, you know, equilibrium point, we can say that where the marginal cost will be equals to marginal revenue, it will be equals to zero. This is the assumption which we have already made. Now looking at the next assumption, we are saying that here in this case, your market demand curve will be linear and it will be downward sloping, right? Which states that again, uh, you know, whenever there will be a change in the price taking place, the output of the firm will got, uh, you know, will, will be uh, uh, inversely related, right? When price will increase, the quantity demanded will decrease and vice versa. So that is why we are assuming that demand curve is downward sloping, which is a straight line. And then the another assumption says that each firm decides its price assuming that the other firm's output is given, right? So when we will talk about further in this model, you'll get to know what we are trying to, uh, you know, understand here in the assumption of this model. So each firm will decide its price assuming that the other firm's output is already given and the firm sells their entire profit maximizing output at the price determined by their demand curves, right? So these are some assumptions for our study of this Cornot model given by Augustine. Now let us look at the example, right? How are we going to understand this model? Uh, we have this example, let us suppose there are two firms, right? There is firm A and firm B, and they are engaged in the production and in the sale of mineral waters, right? Usually this is the model given for the study of duopoly, right? And as we all know, duopoly is again a further, uh, you know, a form which is also available in the oligopoly market. So if in oligopoly market, we have only two seller, duo means two. 
right so that particular market would be considered to be as a duopoly market but this connaught model is also applicable for the study of oligopoly and that is why we are talking here right if the firms are more than two then also we can have this study of connaught model right so let us see that there are two firms and they are engaged in the production and sale of mineral water right and each firms own a spring of mineral water which is available free from nature and that is why we are assume that the marginal cost of these products will be zero right and to understand the crux of this model is the situation in which the firms ignore the interdependence and take decision as if they are operating independently now one thing you have to understand here since we have talked about the features of the oligopoly market that there is always an interdependence right whatever the firms they are deciding either uh, the output or the price of their uh, commodity they always take into consideration the impact or the effect on the competing firm but here in this model we have assumed that the firms behave independently and they are not uh, making any interdependent decisions right so one firms enter the market first and the other firms will follow okay so we have as we have uh, uh, understood this condition also there are two firms one firm will enter earlier into the market and the other firm will enter uh, after this firm which is operating already in the market right so here we have this connaught model again we have this uh, you know x axis where we have output and here we can see that this dd is the demand curve which we have already taken from the assumption that here in this uh, case the demand curve will be downward sloping stated that whenever there will be an increase in the price quantity demanded will decrease and vice versa so this dd is the demand for the market and we have like said we have firm a and firm b right and if you rem remember we have also made the assumption that here the marginal cost is equals to zero so you can see the point where the marginal cost is equals to the marginal revenue that point is called as equilibrium point so here at point a we are having the equilibrium for the firm b and for the uh, firm for, for the firm a and at this point we have equilibrium for the firm b so let us first talk about what firm a is doing here right uh, because because we have already understood that in this uh, model one firms enter first right and then the other firms follow it okay so here we have demand curve this demand curve also represents as an average revenue curve because again this is going to give the revenue to the firm so average revenue firm of this firm uh, you know this is the average revenue Uh, curve okay now you can see average revenue and this is the marginal revenue this is the marginal revenue curve of the firm a represents that the firm is producing uh, half of the demand in the market let's suppose average revenue the demand of the commodity is 2000 in the market right the demand of the commodity is uh, 2000 units in the market so the firm is firm a is only producing 1000 a uh, units of the commodity it is just uh, you know going to produce the half of the demand right so that is why the mr curve is just half of this ar curve and it is again below uh, you know it has been uh, represented again as a downward sloping curve so firm a is producing 1000 unit and this is the marginal revenue of the firm and the price at which they are going to sell the commodity in the market would be this price right this is the output which firm a is producing and the price at which they are selling is the po price okay so this is about the firm a now let us look uh, how, when the firms b enter into the market right so uh, when the firm b enter a is already doing its production right of 1000 unit keeping the half demand of the market now when firm b will enter into the market it will further make an assumption that firm a will continue making its production right keeping in that consideration whatever the demand has been left in the market now firm b, b will enter and started their uh, you know production keeping that demand into consideration now here as we can see the, there is a demand of uh, 1000 unit left in the market so now firm b will enter and because up to this point firm a has already made the production this this point has already been captured this this particular demand has already been captured by the firm a so firm b demand curve will be this right so firm b demand curve will be only this much and uh, this is the demand which they have in the market and this is the marginal revenue curve for the firm b right which is known as 
Stekelberg's model. Now, what is this uh, model all about? This is Stekelberg model is given by German economist H. V. Stekelberg, right? And he developed this model. And this model is basically the sophisticated firms. Uh, the firms determine the reactive curve or the reaction curve of the rival and incorporates it into its own profit function, right? So based on this model, we are saying that the firms which are having the profit, right? The rival firm will try to understand their functions, how they are earning profit, and they try to incorporate that into their firm. So let us have a look to this Stekelberg's model. So this model basically talks about uh, the uh, equilibrium point. So this is basically the extension of the Carnot models which we have uh, discussed previously, right? And where we have seen how the firms are going to get their equilibrium. So here at the point E, we are having this Carnot equilibrium and we are saying that both the firms are going to produce the equal output and selling at the same price. So as per this Stekelberg's model, if a firm A is a sophisticated firm, it will operate within the area, like you can say this is the sophisticated area of the firm A and they will produce the output at which it can maximize its profit, as shown here in this figure A, right? In the follower firms, that is the leadership of a firm A will be following and act accordingly what a leading firm is doing. Now, if you look at the other hand, talking about the firm B is again a sophisticated firm and it will produce up to the equilibrium point which is shown here as point B and they will be producing this OX output, right, which is, uh, you know, the sophisticated firm is going to produce. So in case A firm will act as a follower and B act as a, accepted as a leader, right, they will produce only OXA output. What if both the firms are sophisticated, right? The question here is if we are considering both the firms are sophisticated, then in that case there will be a price war like situation and will either result in a cartel or in the final emergence of firm as a leader. So in the figure you can see that curve A is the reaction of the firm A as well as uh, reaction of the firm B and here in this equilibrium point which is the point A at which the firm A is producing X A amount of the output which a firm B is producing X B amount of the output. So here you can note here that the points both where the firms are in equilibrium because they are maximizing their profit and they have no tendency to change the output. However, this point is reached when each firm is able to assess the other's output correctly and this is achieved after a series of changes they are going to make by each firm in anticipated of the other output which remains unchanged as we have discussed here. So this Stekelberg model is the model which represents the uh, firm how they are being acting as a leading firm or they are uh, the sophisticated firms which the other firms is also following. So this is about this Stackelberg model. Now let us move to the Cartel model. Cartel is basically a very important, you know, uh, distinction of this oligopoly market where uh, the firms can form a cartel and they can work together. They can combine themselves together so as they would be able to enjoy the power of monopoly, right? So cartel is a very important feature of this model, uh, of, of this firm where we are talking about uh, oligopoly market structure. So you can see here this model is known as cartel or the collusion model and sometime to avoid the price war of the firm like we have seen in the price rigidity model if the firm is individually reducing the price there might be a chances of price war right as we have talked about the Stekelberg model in this model also there will be a chances of price war if both the firms are being considered to be as the sophisticated firm. So what they usually try to do is they, uh, they try to make a cartel, right? They try to make a group of uh, all the firms together where they want to take the advantage of monopoly. When they become as a cartel or they work as a cartel, they can have the advantage of monopoly firm also. So they can take a decision like the monopoly and their price will be jointly determined by their MC and the MR curve, right? 
So, they, they will uh, you know determine the outputs together and they will also determine the prices which are to be taken up in the market together. But here what will happen to these carters usually what happen the output which they are determining that they are determining together right they are they are uh, you know uh, thinking of producing this output together but they have to make the production independently right independently each firm will make this production of the uh, you know decided output which they are going to sell in the market and because they are doing their production separately right independently therefore the cost of production will be different for each of them right so what happen usually some of the firms working in the cartel they might be earning super normal profit some of the firms will only earn normal profit so there will be a difference right because they are only determining their output and the prices together they are making the joint decisions but they are separate from each other right they they are own individual firms so whatever the production they are making they are making independently and because of that their cost of production is different from each other and because of that some of them are earning super normal profit and some of them are earning only normal profit or might be possible the some of the firms will also incur a loss so there will be a uh, you know problem with them right so uh, so the, this cartel does not exist uh, for a longer period of time since the profit margins of the firms will be different so uh, this, this this cartel does not last for long because of the profitability they are having uh, that there, there is a difference in the profitability right so let us look at the uh, different types of cartels which can be there the first one is called as centralized cartel right uh, the, the firms can uh, use the strategy of having this centralized cartel centralized cartel is basically an arrangement by all the members where a centralized body deciding on the prices right so what they usually do they again take out a leader uh, or a leading firm among themselves right who all are trying to make this cartel they pick up the leader or they centralize few firms to be a leading firm and based on their decision the rest of the firms will move so as to give benefit to all right and the another uh, way of doing or making this cartel can be your market sharing cartel and here in this market sharing cartel an arrangement is being done by the firm where they divide the market share among them and fix the prices independently right so the market share they have divided already like this is the share which you are going to understand or this is the market which you are going to sell up your output right so they divide the market they share the market and independently they are making their own decision right so this is a kind of a uh, you know understanding they are making with each other so that all of them will be benefited and they should not be at loss uh, because there is an interdependence of firm so whatever we are doing we need to take into account uh, the other firms as well right so how the other firms are behaving uh, otherwise it will be a problem to us because oligopoly is a market where there is an indetermined demand curve and there is an interdependence on the other uh, you know firms operating so here we have different kind of ways of determining the price and output the first one is the centralized cartel where uh, you know all the members make the arrangement and they make a central body where they are deciding their prices and the output whereas in market uh, sharing cartel they divide the market right they divide the market shares among themselves and then independently they are making the decisions so that they, they are not, they should not be bounded by any one of them okay so this is how uh, they they determine this cartel model and sharing of market is aimed at maximizing profit so this important consideration of this uh, market sharing cartel is that they are sharing the market because they want to increase their profitability they want to earn more and more because if they will form a cartel then there might be possibility that all of them have to react on the decisions made by every one of them individual independently right or uh, interdependently right whereas in market share because here the market has been divided right uh, people are clear about what uh, market share they have and where they are supposed to sell the product and how much output has been required so they make their own individual decisions and accordingly they can charge the prices so here uh, their aim is to maximize their profit now if we look at the managerial implication of this oligopoly market right 
So how a manager working under this oligopoly market has to behave or has to react? So firstly, we are saying that managers of oligopoly firm should not try to change its price individually. This is very important, right? With all the discussions we have made and with all the models we have studied here, this is one thing which is clearly, uh, you know, we can understand that an oligopoly firm will never be benefited by changing the price individually because the other firms, if you are increasing the price, then other firms will not follow you. They will not increase the price and then there will be your loss, right? You will be losing your customer. Right. Whereas if you individually reduce the price, the other firms will follow you. They might also reduce the price and then again there will be no change in the demand. So you are not going to get any benefit. So one thing which a manager has to keep into consideration, they should be uh, not taking any decisions regarding the price individually. Rather it is always better that they will uh, you know, discuss each other and then they will change the prices. Then secondly, we are saying managers of the oligopoly firm should try to cut their cost and become the leader, right? As we have this price leadership model, we have this Steckelberg's model, right? Uh, we have this cartel, centralized cartel model, right? So here we have seen that always in the oligopoly market, uh, if there is a leader firm, right, the other firms will follow. Okay, so it is always good if you want to increase your profitability and if you want to keep your prices. So in that case, you need to become a leading firm. And a leading firm will be the firm who produces with the lower cost, right, whose profit margins are more and who are also selling at the, uh, uh, you know, lesser prices, okay. So if you are able to gain those economies of scale where you are able to reduce your cost and becomes a leading firm where you are making other firms your follower, then definitely you will have more of profits. Then third point says that oligopoly firms should try to make collusion, right? As because the demand uh, they are having is a very close substitute, right? The products are very close substitute. So uh, we, you, you cannot even determine the demand for this market. So if possible, so that you can enjoy the benefits of the monopoly, right? You can always go with the cartel. You can always make a collusion because that will help you to have monopoly in the market. And monopoly is because uh, this, this can act as a single selling firm in the market where you can have a control over the supply. You can also take an advantage of price discrimination, right? When all the firms combine together, they can uh, take an advantage of price discrimination. They can charge different prices uh, from different customers based on their paying capacity, based on their requirements, right? So monopoly advantage will also be there with this, uh, with these oligopoly firms, if they become, uh, you know, unite each other, if they make a cartel or if they make a collusion. Then lastly, we are saying that oligopoly firms should reasonably focus on selling, promotion and advertising. Yes, this is very, very important for these two markets, especially for monopolistic competitive market and the oligopoly market. These firms have to, uh, you know, take due consideration on their sales promotion activities, right? They need to focus reasonably on the advertisement and sales promotion so as to increase the uh, demand of their product because we have, uh, you know, products which are of similar nature, which are identical to each other, or if there is a difference, then also they are very closely related to each other, right? So uh, if you are advertising them well, if you are doing good promotions on your, uh, for your product, then definitely you will have more demand in the market because here in this market, consumer usually are indifferent between the choices of these commodities, right? See, better product you will be offering, better advertisement will be there, will help you to attract more and more customers for your product. So these are some managerial implications we have for the managers who are working under the oligopoly market. Firstly, we have seen that they should not be, uh, you know, getting themselves indulged into changing their prices independently because they are not going to give them any benefit. Neither the increasing price will be benefiting them nor the decrease in the price will help them, right? Secondly, we have seen that they should always focus on reducing the cost of their product, right? And to become a leader, they should be doing certain activities where they can be opted as a leader by reducing the cost or by increasing the profit margin, right? 
so that they can take out their own decisions and the other firms will follow them. Third point, we have said that oligopoly firm can also have an advantage of monopoly market if they uh, work as a collusion or they make a cartel, right? They can make various decisions and uh, like a monopolist can take. So it is advisable for them rather than fighting with each other, they can unite with each other, right? And take a better advantage of the market. And lastly, we have seen that oligopoly firms manager should focus on uh, advertisements and sales promotion techniques as much as they can. So this is all for our lecture today. Let us have a review of the topics we have discussed. We have talked about the features of oligopoly market. Uh, what is this market, uh, right? Like we have very few sellers, but the sellers are dominant player in the market and that gives the, uh, you know, barrier to entry. Right, there is no restrictive entry, but yes, there is a barrier to entry because uh, these firms require heavy investments, right? And they have the economies of scale and people also have a preference of their brand in this market, right? Here in this market, the products can be homogeneous or they can be heterogeneous. They can be different from each other, right? If the products are of different, uh, you know, if the products are heterogeneous, then it would be, it would be called as differentiated oligopoly. And if the products are of similar nature, if they are homogeneous, then we call it as a case of pure oligopoly, right? Here the demand curve is indetermined. Again, in this market, selling cost plays a very important role. And there is always an interdependence, right, of the firms for the decisions regarding the price and output. And here in this market, there is also a price rigidity because uh, this will uh, not allow the firms to change their prices independently, right? Then we have talked about the price output determination, how price and output determination can be taken up, right? Where we have seen this Nick demand curve model. Nick demand curve model is also called as price rigidity model and why it is named as Nick demand curve? Because the shape of demand curve is of Nick shape, right? Which represents the earlier portion of the demand is of elastic nature and the previous, uh, you know, part of the demand curve is of inelastic nature, right? So here in this model, we have seen that how a price war will start in this model if all the firms are, uh, you know, reducing their price, seeing the other firm has reduced their price and it will not going to give them any benefit. Then we have talked about this price leadership model and this model uh, stated that uh, the firms which are working under the oligopoly market, any of the firm can be chosen as a leading firm based on different criteria and whatever is being, uh, you know, asked by this leading firm or been done by this leading firm, the other firms will follow it, right? Then we have talked about this Carnot model. Carnot model has various assumptions, right? And understanding those assumptions, we have tried to uh, make this a study between uh, two firms, right? Where uh, one firms enter early into the market, right? Capturing the half of the demand of the market and then other firms enter into the market and also started uh, their production for the remaining half of the, you know, remaining, uh, the half of the remaining half of the markets, right? So here usually the, if there are two firms, they are producing one third and one third of the total output in the market, right? Then we have talked about this Stekelberg's model. Stekelberg model talks about the, uh, you know, further extension to the Carnot's model where we are looking for the sophisticated firm. Right, and we have seen the interaction of two firms, firm A and firm B, where one firm has been considered to be as a sophisticated firm and the other firm has been considered as a leading firm. So how they are going to maximize their equilibrium, how they are going to maximize their profit, that interaction we have talked here under this Stackelberg's model. And lastly, we have talked about the cartel. Cartel is basically where the group, uh, you know, the firms working under the oligopoly market, they join their hands together and they work together as a cartel, as a collusion, right? Here we can have the centralized cartel where the firms, uh, you know, make the centralized decisions regarding the price and output of the product. And there can be a model where we can use this market sharing model uh, or the cartel where the market has been divided. The market share has been divided among the firms and then thereafter they can make their decisions independently. So this is all for our today's class. And here we have these reference books for this lecture. That's all. Thank you all of you.